Hello, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to another episode of In the Red with Curtis White. We're coming off the U.S. National Cyclocross Championships in Cantini Park this past weekend, where I just took a silver medal. It was a hard race, and my friend Tony Seiler will join me in a minute to break down that effort in the race. But before we dive in, I want to say a couple words quick. Um, Nationals is something that I've been chasing for a very long time. It's been a goal of mine, and it's motivated me to really dig deep in my training and really everything surrounding that in my life. And to be honest, this wasn't the easiest conversation to have. But in the end, what I felt most was gratitude. Um, There are always highs and lows in sport. There are always wins and losses. But the most consistent force I feel is the support from the people in my corner. It's my family, the people I love, my friends, the team, the staff, the mechanics. For all those who support and believe in my effort and potential as an athlete, I I just feel immense gratitude for. So we'll talk about that later on. We'll talk about the race, my preparation, and what's coming up next. But before we dive in, I want to let you all know that this episode is sponsored by Whoop. Yes, In the Red has a, a sponsor now. Whoop is a personalized digital fitness, health, and recovery tool that I've been using for a couple years and throughout this entire season. It's helped me monitor my recovery, my sleep, and overall health when I'm pushing my body to its limits in pursuit of my goals. It measures resting heart rate, heart rate variability, respiratory rate, it tracks daily strain, and with the new 4.0 band, skin temperature, blood oxygen, and more. You're able to wirelessly charge your Whoop band and track your measurements with an easy to maneuver app on your phone. Whoop has helped me form healthier habits around my training, traveling, racing, and in life overall. To get in the green, you can go to whoop.com, that's W H O O P, and use the code in the red, all one word, no spaces, so you can save on your first Whoop purchase. That's in the red to get in the green. How's that for marketing? I bet you won't be able to forget that now. (laughs) In the event you happen to forget, I'll include that link in the show notes below. So that's all I have for right now. Let's get into it. The start line, Curtis White here from the Israels and Snow. And ready to go here in Bredena. And we are underway. Van der Poel alongside Curtis White. Tonart right alongside him. And it's the American that gets a hold of the coffee tastes is good this morning. He's got a new podcast in the red. To see him with such a great start today, I know a lot of American fans are going to be really pumped by this. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of In the Red with Curtis White. This is Thursday after the national championships. We're recording this a couple days later than normal. Uh, Monday after the national championships, I was on a plane headed over to Brussels, Belgium to uh, kick off our European campaign. Uh, we're over here for the rest of the season until we come back to the States for the world championships in Fayetteville. So we just wrapped up nationals in Chicago. We had some really exciting racing. Um, yeah, Tony, let's dive into it. How was it? On your end, on the couch, nice and warm, probably enjoying a nice, cold New York Curtis cyclocross yeah. Pilsner. All those things are true. Um, so, it, you know, it was it was OK, but I'll tell you what, I'm a super sore loser and I'm salty. That's what it comes down to. I live my life vicariously through you um, and I'm salty because I'm petty. And that's 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 about that's about the extent of my feelings at this point. <laughs> Spoken like a true New Yorker. I, I can't. I can't <laughs> help it. I can't. It's just the way it is. Nobody's fault. Just the way it is. But um, you know, we'll move on. I guess we'll talk about the race. I'm here. I'm interested in hearing about it from what you saw um, and and how it played out for you. Um, but definitely was was disappointed. Um, but that's racing, right? Yeah. Well, I'll let you know that I saw a lot. You saw a lot. All right. <laughs> Good. I didn't see a ton because it looked like. And this wasn't just your race. Uh, it was just kind of a time trial for every event. Maybe we can get into that a little bit. 
um, about the course? Cause I kind of have some questions about the racing that was created by the course or whether the course created that racing. Uh, some of it, I think was just the coverage, the number of cameras and things like that. Um, but it did, aside from my, my personal bias in terms of, you know, who I'm rooting for, um, it did kind of watch, like just watching one rider ride alone, um, throughout most of the races. So I'm not sure if the course has created that, if the cameras created that or, or what your thoughts are there, but getting a little ahead of myself, I think. <laughs> well, uh, I mean, it, you know, if we're going to follow the trajectory of the CX Harris podcast, we might as well start off talking about the course as well. Um, yeah, I was, oh, I was, I was looking to talk some trash on them today too, but, uh, I guess, I guess I can't, I'm going to sit here quietly. Um, but I had it coming. I, I heard their picks and I was, I was ready to come on guns blazing. But uh, I guess I guess that I'll have to wait. Did you write down some sick burns? Yeah, yeah, I was ready. I was ready, but I won't. I won't do it. All right, so they're going to be our friends for another year. Ah, uh, they're still our friends, even if even if even if I want to bust on them about their their poor nationals choices. Uh, but oh well. Well, end of the day, they were right. But uh, you know, it, it, it was a hard course. I think uh, you know a lot of people made the observation of when the, the first course previews came out that, oh, this is a boring course. This isn't a national championship worthy course. And there's been a trend of this, not just at U.S. nationals, but uh, the last couple of world championships courses, uh, really since Valkenburg in the Netherlands, um, we've had several flatter world championships courses, but yet have yielded some of the most exciting races. And it kind of goes to show that, uh, most of the time it's the racers that make the racing, not necessarily the courses, but the course this past weekend, uh, Cantini park, just outside Chicago, uh, that was hard. Um, and everyone kind of thought that the weather would be the biggest, uh, deciding factor in the race because in that time of year in Chicago, it could be 20 degrees and snowing and, or it could be 50 degrees and raining or muddy or dry even. So, um, we saw some pretty, variable weather throughout the week um some dry racing on a really bumpy course this was on an old golf course uh but there were some pretty bumpy sections that weren't groomed or manicured and uh it took an entire week of racers to really smooth out parts of the course and we saw some rain came, that came in uh, i believe it was friday that really softened up the course and um we've raced on a couple of golf courses before cincinnati is an example where when it does rain, you have this really greasy top layer that for the most part, the course drains well because it's a golf course and they're designed to drain well. But uh, it seemed like the water sit or sat on top of the ground for quite a bit. And I don't know if that's a reflection of um, just under the topsoil that it was frozen because the temperature would go down into the 20s at night. So it, there was this kind of back and forth where it would freeze overnight and thaw out during the day. Maybe you had that greasy top layer um, during the day, got a little slick, some ruts and lines were burned in, and then it froze again overnight. And then Friday we saw some, some rain and over Friday night into Saturday, we had these really, really high winds. Um, if anyone was watching the news, there were some really bad storms going through the Midwest uh, Friday night. Uh, some tornadoes were touching down in some neighboring States and uh, it, it was kind of gnarly. Uh, so we woke up Saturday morning and there were tents all over the park. Uh, our team took our tents down. Uh, the Cannondale team saw the weather coming and they said, we got to tear this down. So they tore down the compound, packed it all away. Um, and it was kind of a chaotic morning. The USA cycling had to really scramble, uh, clean up parts of the park or rebuild parts of the course that were destroyed and come out with a new schedule and kind of move things around and, you know, hats off to them for finding a way to proceed with the event in a, in a safe and orderly way and um, without causing too much disruption because something like that, the weather is just, it's totally out of your control. Uh, but the weather did impact the course and it kind of continued into Sunday where the course continued to dry out from the rainstorm Friday night with the wind that was coming through. And then we saw uh, it was pretty sunny on Saturday or Sunday, sorry. Um, so the course just continued to dry out. And leading into Sunday's race, it was unclear whether there was still that frozen layer of mud underneath that top soil or underneath that top layer. Um, so it, 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 it could have gone either way where the course was going to co still continue to get heavier 
or if it was going to keep drying out. And um, the course eventually did dry out uh, in most parts. And uh, it, it just, it still was a very, very heavy track. Um, you know, hats off to the course designers for creating a pretty heavy track. And, um, you know, it was very physically demanding. So did, I mean, first the wind, um, you know, is not to be taken lightly based on the damage we saw at some places in the country. I mean, I don't want to downplay that at all. That was, I don't know how much you've seen of that because you've been traveling, but, you know, there was some significant horrific damage uh, that we saw that's, you know, not anything that we want to downplay or take lightly in favor of, of a bicycle race. Um, but uh, so it's nice that you guys didn't suffer anything, anything serious, but did the wind play uh, a big damage during the racing on Sunday, like were you guys impacted by the amount of wind in terms of the way it blew the field up or, or did it not? Uh, not really. Um, in some of the higher speed sections, like it, it was a cross headwind on the start finish straight. Um, and we were on the, that was a long start finish straight. Um, but for the most part, the race was blown apart just because of how fast of a pace it was set and how difficult the course was. And the wind didn't play much of a factor, I think. Um, I was able to hop on gauge hex wheel after the first lap, we were chasing down Eric Bruner and he tried to flick the elbow through and it's, I mean, it, it was strong enough to where I didn't want to pull through, but I, I don't think it, it, the wind wasn't the biggest factor on the day. It's more the difficulty of the course itself. Yeah. And it, and it, it was very deceivingly difficult. Um, you know, certainly that, you know, there were some real muddy spots that made it very pedaling heavy. Um, they, the course designers used the undulation really you know, to the best that they could. Um, and, and it wasn't this kind of grass crit flowing course that I think that uh, an earlier course pre-ride video would have led it on to be. You think that's a good thing that we, those are the type of courses we need to see at nationals. I mean, we had such big gaps in, in the racing. It seemed like um, at the elite levels, anyway, I didn't go through and watch all the amateur races, but um the all of the u23 the both elite races the junior races it was pretty big gaps uh between the winners and the rest of the field um is that a good course design is it just with the fields aren't deep enough to manage it is it do we need a different type of course design to create different racing um from a i guess from a viewer standpoint from purely just somebody watching it at home it's not super interesting to watch somebody win by a tremendous amount that starts really early when it's like that every single race over and over again. You know, if you're invested in it, mm -hmm. that's great. You have a, a, an investment in it, but like any of those races were not super compelling to want to keep the TV on and keep watching in a lot of ways, unfortunately. And that's not, you know, I don't mean to be negative about it, but you want to see racing, right? So is that a, is that a course feature we can control? Is it just what happened this time around and that's just racing and next time you could be on the same course and it could be different. Um, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, bike racing is kind of funny like that where, you know, you could race the same course 100 times in a row in the same conditions and it does, it's not going to play out the same way twice. Uh, that's just the nature of the sport. Um, and also, being a cyclocross athlete, you need to be ready for any condition or course that's thrown at you. You can't be super picky and say, oh, you know, I'm a climber, I'm a sprinter, I'm a time trialer, this course suits me. And you don't have that luxury in cyclocross. You need to be this well-rounded athlete that's ready for anything. So um, I, I think it, it's been, a, you know, we had a lot of high level racing earlier in the year. I think it was clear who uh, timed their peaks well and showed up ready to go at nationals who kind of faded later in the season. Um, then you have, you know, these athletes that were consistent all year long that, uh, were performing well at a high level early on, but didn't quite have that peak towards the end. Um, you know, I, I'd put myself in that boat where I felt like I was very consistent all throughout the year. Uh, and my peak wasn't super high as, you know, compared to someone like Eric Bruner who came into the season um, and his results weren't, uh, weren't up to his potential. Um, but he took his time to really kind of come into his own and, we saw a glimpse of his form at the last U.S. World Cup in Iowa City. Um, you know, Cincinnati came around. He took a, a really impressive win there. And then Falmouth, both days, Pan Ams. And, you know, by that time, it, he was – everyone saw him as a very serious contender. Um, so he 
you know, he, he timed his peak well. Someone like Gage Heck always seems to show up to a championship on good form. Um, he's done that several years in a row now. But, you know, I, I felt like I was very consistent this year but wasn't quite able to to find that peak. So it's I, I think it's more of a yes, has something to do with the course, with how difficult it was. Uh, but it, there, there are a lot of factors that go into that. Um, but also, too, it's a, when you have televised coverage, the biggest critique we always hear from viewers is that they only show the leaders or the top mm -hmm. three or only the winner. Um, you know, I, I was going back to watch the, the flow bikes covered the nationals and they really focused on the winners, which is it's great. You're focusing on the best athletes in the country. But there's there's a storyline that you need to follow and to to make this content interesting. You know, we're creating a storyline out there, giving it 100 percent racing for a title, um, you know, and, and it's up to the media to kind of capture that and promote that storyline. Yeah, and I guess that's that's what I mean. I don't want to make it sound like I'm taken away from anybody who won or their efforts because I don't and I'm not I'm not implying that they wouldn't win on a different course or that their efforts weren't valid. Um, what I mean is when you're marketing it, especially at the elite level to people, particularly people who don't know a lot about the sport or are newer to the sport, like my neighbor was down, you know, he's a he's a, been bike racing for a long time, but he's not following cycle cross. So he came over to watch it. You know, I know there was a party at Stu Ben Brewing where they were watching it. Um, so you had a lot of people who are not don't know a lot about the sport that are watching it. And as I was watching the coverage of it, I'm thinking, man, if I knew nothing about it, I would be kind of bored because I'm just watching this one person ride alone, essentially. And not in just in the men's race, in the women's race too. Um, and, you know, I know there's a number of reasons for that, that we know because we're, you know, more in tune with what's happening. But like when you're presenting it at face value to somebody who you want to be invested in this and it's televised and we're saying this is a professional sport and you should be entertained by this. And we're only seeing one person ride around the course alone in what looks like a time trial. Most of those people are going to walk away. You know, they're just going to go do something else. So um, whether that's changing the course setups, like we, we talked about some of the reasons people don't like those world's courses is because they're designed so specifically for TV. But I, I thought the world's courses were pretty good the last couple of years, uh, especially two years ago. I really enjoyed it two years ago. But regardless of that, you know, setting them up for TV as well as the TV coverage so that when we are putting them in front of people who are at a bar, who's showing the race, who don't know anything about it. There's something compelling for them to be attracted to. And I, you know, that's my point about how do we be more cognizant about that, I guess, or mm -hmm. where can we control that? Right. I, I totally agree, Tony. You know, it's, I think the experience of the viewer really needs to be taken into account as, you know, we have the USCX series that's now being televised with a multi-year deal. We've had the national championships that have been te televised for a number of years. Now uh, the world cups in the U S have been televised. Um, it, there are some really incredible opportunities to showcase to showcase how cool the sport is here in America. Uh, but, it, uh, you know, how do we kind of cater to the experience of the user or, or, or to the viewer rather um, and continue to promote the sport and attract as many people as we can? That's I mean, you know, that, that that's that's the job of the media to kind of promote that storyline. Um, you know, we're out there, we're racing and, you know, we're giving it a hundred percent, um, you know? Yeah. So it's, I, 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 I thought it was very interesting though, that the racing wasn't, it, it, it was more of a time trial, uh, across all categories. And we saw that with, as you said, nearly all the juniors, the under 23s and both elite races. Um, yeah, it, it just, it was very clear that it was a strong, uh, strong riders course and you know, who the strongest on the day was. All right. Yeah. yeah. And then you, you have to, you compound that by courses being developed for amateurs versus elites. And it's a whole, it's, it's not an easy problem to solve. I'd love to talk to um, somebody who designs some of like the world cup courses and has mm -hmm. a lot of experience there and ask them, you know, how do they design courses to get different types of racing and, and what that plays in, you know, as a guy who's put on some amateur races you know, I do that at a really low level with athletes who are, you know, amateur level athletes, but you still think about that. Like how does, how, what kind of racing is this course going to develop for the people that are racing on it? Right. right? I would love to talk to somebody who does that at a really high level consistently. And how do they do that? Because I think that's sort of the next level of, of competition when you're, when you're getting televised coverage of these events, which I think is wonderful. And I want to see that continue. So it's more yeah. of a, uh, what can we have a discussion around that?
Right. Well, I will say that, it, I mean, it really wasn't that challenging of, of a course technically. Um, yeah. It, I mean, we're on a golf course. There's really not a lot of features to use. You have the big sand pit at the beginning of the lap. Um, a lot of the undulation, they use that uh, the Abus Hill uh, really well as much as they could to get as much elevation out of that park as they could. Um, and there was a lot of elevation. And I think if it was a bit more slick um, and a li little less heavy, uh, it could have been a very technical track, but there were no features that scared you. Yeah. You know, you, you could go around some of these cor corners or off cameras very quickly, uh, but there was no feature that scared you um, or something that was that challenging or daunting. Uh, even the UCI only sections, it was just, it was an added off camber um, or a couple added off cambers um, or a small little hill you had to ride up. There wasn't anything really challenging or daunting about this course. It was a very pedaling heavy track. Um, the weather did add another element to it. Um, but again, it, it just wasn't, it, it wasn't the, the, the technical track that a lot of people, I guess, wanted to see when they, they were talking about, oh, this seems like an easy course. It wasn't an easy course. It, it was a very difficult track that, you know, when you're at your maximum, it was easier to make mistakes or slide out in a corner, especially if it was slick, but there were no real technical features. Like if I'm, if I'm thinking about a track like, you know, a Namur. We're going to see that track coming up this weekend. Um, some of those descents scare you, <laughs> like physically. It's, I remember, and Namur was, it was the second race I ever did in Europe. The first race I did, it was, man, uh, maybe nine years ago, almost 10 years ago. Uh, Lichtervelde, small, uh, small race in a Belgian farm field. That was kind of our, our introduction to European cyclocross really wasn't much there. It was in the middle of a flat field. The next day we go to Namur and we're on the side of the Citadel. It's a world cup and you're dropping down the side of the Citadel and it scares you. Uh, yeah. And there, you know, there are, you know, there, there are cyclocross tracks that are, you know, they're different all over the world and they bring different unique features and things and uh, things that attract spectators. But um I guess that's the one thing I have to say about the nationals course, but I think they, uh, the course designers in USA cycling really used that park, um, the best that they could, um, with the space that they had. So I, I think it was a, it, it was a good event or a good course. All right. So how about what else we got to know about just the way the racing played out? You did kind of talk a little bit about it, but you want to break down sort of how the race went. I mean, what other, what other thoughts should we get in terms of that insight? Yeah, I mean, it, uh, there was a unique feature of the, the conditions were changing um, with the wind and with the sun. Uh, it was a little bit unclear Sunday because it even around the when the pro women went off that there was this uh, layer underneath the, the mud that was already exposed. That was this frozen, greasy mud under this this top layer. So there was this impression of, man, it, the course really could get a bit heavier. The mud could get deeper. Um, so it's, I, I was out on Limus tires, which are the heaviest, or, or, or they have the most bite, the most traction. The, you know, those are the heaviest tires that we have um, at 19 PSI. Um, and I felt like on the start line, you know, on the first lap, that was too heavy. I, I had too much rolling resistance. And I felt like that was, I felt like I was fighting the bike, um, trying to put out too much power and keep, keep the pace with Eric Bruner and Gage Hecht. And they were, you know, very clearly we're on a high level and we got the gap early on. Um, and on the second lap, I switched to baby Limus because it's, I needed something that was a lower profile, a little bit less rolling resistance. And, um, you know, I, I, you know, I was putting out too much power with the Limus tires. So it was, it was too much bite. Uh, I, my, with the knowledge I had at the time, um, I thought that those the frozen layer underneath that top layer of mud was going to continue to soften up and cause the course to get a little bit more slick and a little bit heavier and it didn't so that was that was the information i had at the time that was my biggest mistake um but even then once i switched to the baby limus tires um i i felt like i was riding a much smoother race technically a little bit better was able to save uh save some power but um you know that, that, that was the best I've seen Bruno ride all year long. And to be honest, um, a little, a little frustrating when you see that because it's what, what could I have done? Um, 
you know, and, and to be honest at this moment, I don't think I have an answer. Um, and maybe it's not worth overthinking, but, um, I mean, that's all I can say is hats off. Did you uh, expect him to come out that hard? Was that part of, he's been starting fast, uh, for a number of races and I did expect that. Um, I was worried for a second because I did have a poor start. I was back in almost 10th or 11th, um, two corners into the race. Um, we go into the heavy sand pit and I wasn't in prime position. So I took a, a gamble. Everyone was staying on the more firm side of the sand pit, which seemed to be more towards the right. It set you up a little bit better for the exit. Uh, but I knew I had to stay out of it. If I didn't move out of that traffic lane, I was at a risk of getting stalled or someone making a mistake in front of me. So I went all the way left in the sand pit and created my own line. It was a little bit heavier, but I was able to move past the traffic. Uh, I came in with good momentum, took that risk, and I moved up from 11th to 4th or 5th immediately on the wheel of Gage and Bruner. And so when they, when Bruner started to ramp up the pace, I was able to respond pretty quickly. Um, got around, you know, Tobin Nortonblad had a good start. I was able to get around him pretty quickly, hold on to Gage and Eric's wheel. But it was very, again, clear that, uh, you know, Bruner was setting setting a good pace and, you know, I, I tried to correct my mistake early on and, um, you know, he, he just continued to ride at a high level. Yeah. Well, congratulations to him. He did. He, he rode fantastically. And I was rooting for him to run out of gas for, for the entire race because he went out so hard, but he, he didn't, you know, so, um, you know, he lays that, lays that down and it'll give you something to wrestle with for a year and, and you'll come up with a solution, I'm sure, but it'll, it'll take a while. Um, how about, the battle at the end between you and Gage, we didn't really see much of it. Again, the, the camera was a lot on, on Bruner, but um, can you tell us what happened there? I know the announcers were talking about a shoe issue. Um, can you give us a breakdown of how that played out? Yeah, it was. Uh, so when you're in a situation like this, when it's the race seems to be a time trial, it's, it, it's really, you need to be mentally strong throughout that effort because you need to always be attentive about bringing your, you know, as much speed into every single section, kind of laying off the brakes, being technically proficient and carrying your momentum out of these sections, having good exit speed um, and saving your energy when you can and making sure that you're able to gauge the effort to where you do have a really strong last couple laps. Uh, Because, I mean, Bruner could have absolutely come apart, you know, you know, going out too hard, too early, burn up all his matches. He could have started to fall back or, have a crash and set himself back or gauge could have done that. Um, and I think that's what eventually did happen in the final half lap, um, throughout the race gauge had a bit of an advantage over me. It was Bruner then gauge than myself, uh, then a pretty big gap back to the, the battle for fourth. Um, but I, 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 it's kind of funny because in sport, you, no matter where you are, no matter how bad things seem to be going for you, Uh, you need to keep convincing yourself that you're still in it, that you're still in the fight. And you need to be very mentally strong in a moment like that. So throughout the entire hour, I convinced myself that I was still in a position to, to get second or potentially win. And it's just whether from the outside, that's the reality or not athletes need to, uh, to perform at a high level. They need to kind of alter their perception of reality to an extent. So I, I convinced myself I was still in it and to still be technically proficient, not get discouraged, not get discouraged by mistakes that I was making on the course if I slipped or just to keep having a clean effort and to keep pressing forward. Um, and I really, I, I focused on bringing my best into the final two laps where I felt like that was where I started to really close the gap to gauge. Um, and the gap did come down to Bruner as well. It came down maybe 15, 20 seconds almost um to Bruner but in the final half lap I saw the gap was getting pretty close and uh, coming into the the new Belgian stairs I heard that Gage slipped there there were a couple of spectators or a couple of fans on the stairs and I didn't see Gage slip I heard them go ooh, and we're the only two people on that part of the course and just that the expression that the the fans there in that part of the course had was indication enough for me to just rally the last half lap and give it 100% that I had. So I came, 
off the staircase and I saw the gap was significantly less to gauge. Um, I didn't know if he hadn't had an issue or a crash or whatever, or he just lost his steam. It was, I, I was zeroing in on the target. That was laser vision. Bells are ringing. Whistles are blowing. Like it just, that's go time. You have three minutes left of a championship. Um, and I was able to get to Gage's wheel. I saw he was fiddling with his shoe. Uh, I assume that he, he slipped and, um, you know, hit his boa buckle or whatever, or apparently the, the buckle came undone. It wasn't broken, but he was spinning it, but it was that frantic moment of he was looking back, saw me charging. So he wanted to really keep the pressure on the pedals, but he couldn't give his shoe the attention it needed because I was close enough. Um, and then I was able to come around him in the, the final couple of minutes um, and get the advantage over him coming into the start finish straight. And I was able to take second. So I think physically uh, gauge raid raced a, a, a good race and he was strong enough for a silver medal. Um, but again, this is cyclocross. Anything can happen. It could happen to, could have happened to Bruner could have happened to myself. It could happen to anyone. Um, and it took over an hour of mental strength and effort to keep myself in a position where I could strike like that. So again, you know, everybody's number comes up at some point, you know, the bad luck goes around and I, again, he raced a very, very strong race. So, um, yeah. So in the end, Bruner, my Bruner won it, uh, silver for myself gauge third. Yeah, I mean, obviously that never quit mentality certainly paid off for you. Um, and as you said, it can happen to anybody. Gage benefited from something similar, uh, maybe more extreme last time around with, with the tape. So, you know, it's, it's the gone tape both, gate. The tape gate, you know, and not to imply that he wouldn't have won that race anyway. He, he rode unbelievably, um, you know, that day. Um, but obviously he's benefited from it and lost him. And I'm sure he's, he's able to bounce around, bounce back from that. He understands that. So, uh, but it was nice to see you pull that out. So you, you actually brought these stats up. So um, I guess I want to get your take on that. You've listed out here um, your so it, finishes. It, it, yeah. So these stats came from uh, Colin Reuter from Cross Results. Um, he was able to dig these stats up. Cross Results goes all the way back to 2006. Um, but my first national championships was, was 2005. Uh, back in Providence, Rhode Island, it was the first year in Providence, Rhode Island, where we had that crazy snowstorm. Um, ah, man, that was such a fun course. <laughs> you know, just kind of thinking about that because I was I was ten years old. That was you know, uh, really the first year that you know I, I was hooked on cyclocross, and I had a lot of really um, influential people kind of supporting me through those years and kind of getting me hooked and involved in cyclocross. And having looking back now. Um, having that be my first championship and look looking back on my career all the highs and lows and balancing multiple disciplines and balancing my academics with the sport and how far I've come uh and the support from my my friends and my family over all these years it's it's kind of uh there's a lot of gratitude that 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 I feel behind these stats um so but, for uh, people who can't see them, I mean, you know, I definitely want to know how you feel about them. Um, so we got a, over the course, uh, since 2005, because as you said, you included 2005, you got one sixth place finish. These are at national championships, uh, three fifth place, three fourth place, three third place, and sixth, six second place. So as you look at those things, what do you, what do you think and how do you feel about, I mean, it's, that's it's incredibly impressive. Obviously, there's something missing, but that's incredibly impressive. So, what do you? How do you feel about that when you see that? Um, gratitude and motivation, I guess, of the two. You know, as I said before, it's. To, to be in a, involved in a sport in a community for this long um, and to have that amount of success. And I mean, it, these are amateur national championships as well, but, um, you know, four professional national championships. Um, I, I was, I believe, fifth in my first elite national championship and then the last three editions, silver medal, second place. So it's, um, I, I'm proud of those results. 
Um, I, I'm grateful. I'm motivated, but um, I think after three silver medals in a row, there's really no mixed feelings after after that. As a whole, I, I'm I'm very proud of those, but after uh, this this last result, I don't have any mixed feelings about. It'll it'll make it that much sweeter when you wear that jersey someday, my man. <laughs> Cause it's coming. Well, it's, you know, it, it, it's good motivation. So, you know, take the time to decompress. Um, you know, it's okay to feel frustrated in these times or, but it, it's all about how you respond to these adversities, not just in sport, but in life, of course, um, taking the, t- the time to reanalyze where can I continue to improve and, um, you know, just continuing to see every challenge as an opportunity to, to develop and grow and, um, to continue to develop my craft as an athlete, as a cyclocross racer, and to, to continue to strive to be the best uh, that I can be. And that it's, it, of course, it's my goal to be national champion, and it's something that I want and something that I've been chasing for very long. But I, I think it was um, after Pan Am's Zach Schuster, uh, from the CX Harris Bulletin, um, we were talking after the race, and he was asking about, um, I mean, uh, of course, they're, you know, talking about the stats and not winning a championship up to this point and um, how that motivates me. And um, it, it kind of gave me a moment of reflection because for a number of years, I had very many close calls um, coming down to the last half lap or the last minute of a championship where it kind of slips away sometimes. Um, and if those moments didn't happen, I don't know where I would be in this sport. Maybe I wouldn't be as involved as I am now. Maybe I would become complacent. Uh, but I know that those experiences and those, um, you know, the races where I didn't succeed uh, and, and the ability or, or, or the lessons that I've learned to kind of pick myself back up to reanalyze and to continue trying and to improve on the mistakes that I made or what I need to continue to move forward, that those lessons, that ability, those skills that I've kind of cultivated over my entire career have brought me to where I am right now. So it's as, as much as, you know, it can be disappointing. Um, it's important to go back to that sense of gratitude um, because that's, that, that's what I feel the most. Um, that's what I feel the most when I, in losses, because it's at the end of the day, when you realize that it's not just you, um, there, there's a great picture that Meg, um, our, our team photographer took where it's just my dad and I, after the, the finish line, I saw that. And it's, you know, throughout my, my entire life, he's, he's been someone that, you know, we win together and we lose together and knowing that you have the support of, um, you know, a uh, family, friends, loved ones that, you know, they're all behind me. It's, uh, you know, it, it's just gratitude. Um, and, and there are things that are larger than sport and to, to know that I have a support system that, uh, believes in what I'm doing is, is something very special. So it's, you know, it's one day of the year, you know, we'll see you in 360 days, wherever nationals is going to be next year. <laughs> and, uh, I'm, uh, I'm committed to continuing to improve and to bring my best and to, to still chase down that Jersey. All right. Well said, man. I'm proud of you, my friend. It's a, it's a great perspective. Yeah. So let's let's leave nationals behind because we got some other stuff to talk about and lots of good racing ahead. Uh, before we do though, quick shout out to Caleb Schwartz. What a ride from him, man! I was yeah. I was I was stoked for him. I wish we saw more of that battle with Kerry. Um, it looked really cool from what little bit we saw, but um, I was just really happy for him. So shout out to him um, on a good performance that day. So let's talk about, uh, we still got a really exciting chunk of the season here. You're, you're beginning, uh, your European campaign. We still got American worlds. Um, and I want to get your take. Did you watch the snow cross? I want to watch the snow cross. I, well, I didn't know you've been traveling. (laughs) I wasn't sure. I just, I knew you would normally watch it, but you've been had a hectic couple of days. So I was curious what you thought about that too. Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, yes, we are transitioning to this, you know, the, the next, um, phase of the season the next block of the season over in europe and actually um so we flew out of chicago direct to brussels monday night we you know after the race decompressed sunday night monday morning packed everything up uh, 
the the team RV, the camper is going down to to Fayetteville where we'll see it again in Worlds. All the riders and staff, the mechanics, um, going over to Europe. And there were probably about a dozen bike bags in the bottom of the plane. We were delayed pushing off from the gate because it took so long to load all the luggage into the plane. So I blame the cyclists, right? <laughs> you know, even when you're off the road, it's the cyclists that are holding you right. up. Holding you know, up transportation. Yeah, they're like holding that, up planes. Right. They're holding up the cars. <laughs> they're holding up everyone. Stay in your lane, cyclists. Um, but it, there was a number of people that were on the plane. Kerry uh, and the Kona squad was on the on the plane. Caleb Schwartz was on the plane. Um, it, it, it was cool to see so many familiar fl- uh, some familiar faces when you travel. Just because, I mean, it's especially when you're going to a different country or you know transatlantic flights. Um, travel days are long and. They're not always very smooth. So just to know that there are familiar faces around you, uh, it, it just makes it a little bit more enjoyable. Um, and being able Is it to exciting catch- to be there this year with more Americans and and maybe more of the cities opened up and, the, and everything opened up a little bit more? I oh, saw you absolutely. were training with Lance. Like that's got to be fun to have that extra energy there with all those guys and everybody kind of being on the same team now as you're, as you're over there a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's kind of one of those things where we always feel that, you know, when we're in a foreign environment, we always kind of come together a little bit more because it's, you know, yeah, we're racing against each other, but also we're all in the same boat. We're away from our, from our, our communities, from our families, from our friends, especially during the holidays now. And it's just like, you know, it's good to come together and we all have our, you know, we make Christmas our own here. We get a little tree. We put the the Yule logs on the TV, and you get the the Christmas music going. And it's just it, it's a it's a fun environment. And um, where we're staying, uh, in Sittard in the Netherlands, it's just over the Belgian border. Um, it's where USA Cycling Compound is set up, um, and the Watersley Sports Talent Park. We've been coming here for oh my goodness, when did I start coming here? Uh, last year, junior. Is that nine years ago? I think it's I think maybe you said nine, 10 nine years ago. I think you said this was your 10th year. Is that right? 10th year coming to Europe. So maybe nine years because my mm-hmm. first year here, the first year I raced cyclocross, uh, we stayed in Isigam in okay. Flanders. And then the next year it was in Vorselar, right near the, the Liktar Forest. But I was splitting my time on the road. We were coming to Sittard. So when I was racing with the national team for the road, we were coming to to Sittard. But when I was with the Eurocross camp formerly, now Eurocross Academy, um, and they still are doing their programs here in Europe, um, we were in Vorselar, and they still are based out of Vorselar. It's much a little bit more centrally located to all the races. Um, then you have uh, Kerry, Caleb, uh, a number of other athletes are staying at either the Chainstay or uh, other places around Odenard in Belgium. It's on the other side of Brussels from where we are. Um, so they're a bit further away, but we have a really good compound here in uh, Sittard, in Watersley. Uh, Magali Rochette is staying in the house right across from us. Uh, Lance Haydet, Caitlin Bernstein are right in the house, direct, in the other direction next to us. Uh, there's the USA Cycling Compound. Uh, Andrew Strohmeyer was out training with us today. I went on a great ride with Lance Haydet. It was 50 degrees and sunny. Uh, so it's it, it's nice to come to a familiar environment and be with familiar faces and people in your community already. So it's just, it it makes it a bit easier coming here. Um, especially after last year where things were very shut down, we didn't have the vaccine. Um, everything was shut down and we really had to keep our bubble very, very tight. It was home races and grocery store. That was it. Um, now that I, I think we're able to move forward in a, in a safer way, um, it, 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 it makes it a bit easier to be over here. That's awesome. That sounds really fun. So what do you think of the snow cross? You want to do this? You think this works? I'm, I'm, I'm dying to know here. I got, I was good. I wanted to text you during it. I was watching it live that morning. Um, but you were getting ready to race. And I didn't want to distract you. I actually so, was watching it the morning of our nationals. I figured I was, you. I was doing a morning were. spin on the rollers in the hotel, yeah, and I put up and I put up Val de Soleil on the uh, on the TV. I was just watching it, and I it, it I kind of wished I was there. Actually, I not kind of. I definitely wished I was there, but uh, it seemed like such. I mean that, that that's such a cool thing um, to have the snow cross. 
And if yeah. you think about it, there, there are a lot of very unique races where it's not just, oh, well, we don't know what the conditions are going to be like today. You know, we'll just have to wait and see. Um, that's not always the case. You go to Coxida, it's the sand cross. Um, right. You know, there, there are some courses that are just so specific to you know, to the conditions you're going to see. And I think it's really exciting to see um, something like a Val de Soleil where they are trying to replicate having an event entirely on snow and ice. Um, and I think that, you know, Flanders Classic is trying to provide a case uh, to have or to try and have cyclocross in the Winter Olympics to show that we can do this sport. Yes, it's a winter sport, but very rarely is it actually on snow and ice. So right. to try so and have an event in accordance with the rules and regulations of the winter Olympics. So did it work? Is it still cyclocross? And, you know, is that the right, is that the right route? Or are there changes that you'd, you'd have to make? Like as much as we're saying, we, we want cyclocross the Olympics, which I totally agree. I think cyclocross the Olympics, summer, winter, whatever is a huge advantage. There's financial advantages. There's all kinds of advantages that, that are very clearly documented, but how much do you change the sport away from what it traditionally is in order to make that happen versus how much do you hold what it is? Like, where's the balance there? Cause yes, it's cyclocross, but also, and sometimes you race in snow, but not like that. Right. That's pretty unique. So like, mm-hmm. Is it still cyclocross? Does it work that way? Is that the way to pursue the route or not? What do you think? Uh, uh, I mean, they're going to have to pursue that road if they want it in the Winter Olympics. I think alternatively, uh, they make a bid for the Summer Olympics. But then again, how many summer or cycling disciplines do we have already in the Summer Olympics? Right. Uh, there's a lot of sports that are happening that time of year and that are trying to bid for the Summer Olympic spots. Um, I, I think it's if they can provide a model and show that they can have this sport be in snow and ice. Great. Um, the only difficulty is that very few events from cyclocross are actually on all snow and ice. Right. I mean, so you you're going to, you're going to have to have though, very right? specific cyclocross races that do that because the majority of, right. I mean, it, you start in September and you go right. until Feb- end of February. Yes, it's the off-season sport that you do if you're – it started off as the off-season sport that you do if you're a professional mountain biker or a professional road rider. Um, but then it's turned into this thing where you, you have athletes that specialize in cyclocross that want to perform well, and they've been able to monetize it here in Belgium, and it's really a part of the culture. Um, I mean, you, you could just see how folks relate. To, to the athletes here, to the culture of the sport and kind of that drive. And uh, it, it, it's very unique here. And they've been able to kind of cultivate that scene in a small environment. I think it's important to continue to try and globalize the sport. I think we have a lot of advocates that are pushing for that uh, and trying to get it in the Winter Olympics. Um, and just to help monetize the sport a bit more. I mean, it's it's not that difficult to understand that Olympic sports receive more corporate funding um, and sponsorship dollars and attention than non-Olympic sports. Right. You know, unless you're able to completely monetize something as, as unique as well, like an American Ninja warrior or something. Um, I mean, that's really cool and unique. Right. Um, They get a lot of TV time, but it's, that's its own little niche. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of, that's, yeah, that's a different sort of animal. Yeah, because I think you got to have opportunities for racers to compete and train if that's going to be the conditions. Because this was the announcer, I, you know, I'm kind of quoting the announcer who was supposedly quoting Mariana Voss, but during the race, during the women's race, um, he said that she said, so, if, you know, kind of cover my butt there if I'm wrong, but she said this is like a different discipline uh, mm-hmm. as she's out there racing it. So it's like you guys got to develop new skills almost or, or different skills a little bit. So you got to have more than just, you can't just jump into the winter Olympics and race that course every time. It's going to look like a, a circus more than a sport, which was kind of yep. part of it too, you know, and that it kind of played out a little bit with the, the headlines from the Chicago, right. Of like, Oh, come watch people eat mud all the time or whatever. Get yeah. Mud. It, I'll, I'll be honest. That of, kind of bummed me out. You yeah, know, it's I mean, it's a circus well, promotion. We're it, not right? trying to like promote it. the sport of cyclocross as kind of this, you know, we're flailing around in the mud. This is kind right. of mud pit right. wrestling and people are picking up dollar bills or something. I mean, it's you look at some of the, the best athletes here in North America or the best athletes in the world, and you understand kind of the, the technique and the speed that goes right. into the sport. Right. I, yes. I mean, you're always going to have this very relaxed part of the sport that's, I mean, there's something for cyclocross for everyone. 
Um, and that's a really unique part of the American cyclocross community. But to, I, again, I think the sport can be better promoted. Um, you know, and the, this is a much broader conversation, but we are in a Eurocentric sport trying to promote it in America. Culturally, it works well in Europe, but the American culture is a bit different. So um, people are constantly trying to find ways to relate to uh, to folks not involved in the cycling community to kind of attract them. And, you know, how, how do you continue to do that? So it's, you know, with that in America, it is a bit of, you know, the, the onus is on the, the athletes, the riders to, to promote the sport, um, and kind of educate people and to, yeah, to well, and the media to and the media and, you know, the promoters, everybody's involved to, you know, it's okay. That storyline is kind of okay. If we're talking about amateurs, a little bit, I guess, but when we're talking about professionals, it's definitely not. And even with amateurs, it's problematic. Um, it kind of reminds me of the progression of, of UFC and MMA fighting where in the nineties, it's these, you know, it's this freak show of no weight classes. You get a sumo guy who fights a guy who's 150 pounds and it's just sort of freak show, but then they get weight classes and it starts to look more like boxing and it gets more traditional and there's more analysis and it becomes more, you know, becomes a legitimate professional sport. Um, and it's that same sort of circus feel that we get when we talk about the mud. And I'm concerned when we go back to the snow, that snow kind of presents it the same way if athletes aren't trained to it and used to riding in it. And this was my other question for you is, is there an argument to allowing a wider tire option than what the UCI regulates uh, when it's a full snow course so that you have more control to race it more? So it looks more like a race and it's less of just riders slipping all over and looking kind of silly at times. Yeah. I don't know, Tony. I, I think it's, I mean, it, it, the tire width regulation was, you know, originally brought in to kind of make the sport more accessible and approachable to everyone. So it's, I mean, we don't have people that, you know, you have these mega teams that have these gigantic budgets that are able to, to drop thousands of dollars on all these different, tire choices from 28 mil to 35 mil tires of all these different um you know different treads and widths and it, it just it, it was meant to kind of regulate that and kind of have everyone on the same page and kind of make that barrier a little bit lower um but i mean it's the the pendulum always swings back the other direction so if we want to continue to incorporate snow racing um maybe that's an option um and it's going to kind of d disrupt the tubular market as well to, you I mean, to bring a new model like that in, I, I think it could be really exciting. Um, mm -hmm. But I think it's the immediate issue is having multiple races in snow, not just one, one a year. Um, yeah. You go back to our national championships in Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, when was that? 2017, I believe. Uh, that was the only race of the year that was on snow and ice. And it was a very unique race we all had to be prepared for it. There were a lot of people crashing and sliding around and having a good time. Um, but it's, I think for it to proceed in the direction of going towards being in the winter Olympics, they need to prove that they can regularly either practice or compete on snow and ice. And to only have a, like a one hit wonder a year or only one race a year doing this, I don't think it's possible. They're going to need to have several races a year um showing that we can do this yeah see yeah. and you know we're talking about those i you know several ideas that you might or probably hate you know piggybacking off of bill's idea my idea that you definitely hated was <laughs> races in march well, i think, I think you said after, february after now we're going to march we started with february we're going into march now huh? oh yeah yeah but we're gonna be in april too <laughs> no but it's i i think uh you know, after the conventional season's over, you know, finding a, you know, a, a ski slope that's not uh, in, you know, that's not really being used as much. Um, just have a couple of races there. February, I don't know if we need a ski slope. We can do it in my house. I got a, I got a bunch of big fields and hills, man. Uh, you, you, just you should promote, promote a couple of cross races. A couple of February. You got to get races. Magnus Sheffield out. Uh, have him work <laughs> on his technical skills. <laughs> And he and I will be sliding around your backyard in the middle of yeah, March. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure that's exactly what Magnus is, is focused yeah. on training right now. Uh, but yeah, you and Magnus can come race in my backfield. That'd be great. I'll sit there and drink New York Curtis 
and my daughters and I'll holler at you and you two can race around in the snow. Sounds yeah, like right. good entertainment. <laughs> Just bring the cowbells. <sighs> All right. All right. So what's, uh, what's the first race in, in Europe? What's the schedule look like? Uh, it's, it's a pretty dense, uh, schedule here. So we're here for the next month. Um, racing kicks off only a couple days away. Uh, world cup in Rookfin in the Netherlands. Um, world cup in Namur is the next day, this Sunday. Then we have about a week off until the Dendermonde world cup. And then after that, the, the schedule gets very hectic. Uh, there's more racing that can be done. Uh, but I'm choosing to kind of relegate it a little bit just kind of dial it back a little so i can focus on recovering and bringing my best into every opportunity so i'm able to get the most out of this block uh, so starting with rookfin namur dendamonda going to low and the x2o series there then ball new year's day the world cup in holst which they just announced that they're going to have in the city but without spectators and that course is absolutely wild you're going down the side of the like uh, just the city walls here down around the moat uh around this i mean you could tell this is a medieval city that's been you know, around for the last thousand years or so well fortified and you're just going up and down the, the the grassy walls of the city it's it's such a cool course such a cool venue uh bummer that it's without spectators but of course safety first um herentals a couple days off then autogam autogam is a smaller race it's generally a um kind of to showcase the recent national championship winners so it's it's just on the other side of brussels from where we are and it's it's a smaller cross it's monday after the championships on sunday um so it's after the celebrations everyone gets back going the next day for another cycle cross race to show off those jerseys and then we're finishing off this block in france at the flamenville world cup um right it, it's it's in britannia it's actually it's very close to where uh i used to race uh several years ago on rally we would do tour of normandy or the tour of britannia in that region of france so it's I, i'm familiar with that area near the coast uh in northwest france so it's uh we're gonna finish off our european campaign there and then fly back on January the 18th, that's a Tuesday, back to the States, and uh, finish our preparation for the World Championships in Fayetteville. So All over right. the, the over the course of the month, that's nine races. Nine races. They should all be televised yep. in one capacity or another. World Cups will be on flow, so you got one, yep. two, for, three. For our four, American listeners, World, Cup. uh, World Cups on flow bikes, mm -hmm. uh, X2O, super prestige races. All of those will be on uh, on GCN. Yeah. Cool, man. I love this block. I love it. I yeah. love it when you race it, over it, there. It's exciting, the curse the period coverage. over here. It's. I mean, I, I've been coming over here for a number of years since I was the first year junior, and I was talking about my my experiences, the first couple races I've done over here. Um, and it, it's just absolutely wild. So it's, you know, I started off racing. I'm the same year as, as, as Matthew Van Der Poel, Quentin Hermans, uh, that that generation of riders, that's my year. Wout was a year older than me. The first time I competed against Wout, uh, not the first time, but uh, he was a second-year junior. I was a first-year junior at my first world championships in Coxida. That was 2012, I believe. Um, but it, it, it's, it, it's, been kind of, it, it's been very cool from my perspective to continue to look up to those athletes and see their progression in the sport. And, and to chase that and try and replicate that, even though I'm not in the same, uh, you know, I'm a continent away. It's a different scene, different community, but still trying to replicate and see that as the level that I need to reach. Um, not just being the best in, in the U.S., but I want to be one of the best in the world. And so seeing that class of riders is where I want to be and kind of the marker um, for what I want to be success. So, um, yeah. It, it, it's it's always it's great to be back this is i always feel that this area is my home away from home and um yeah 10 years later <laughs> it's yeah. kind of hard to believe but I, I'm, I'm very happy and excited to be back here i'm excited for the racing for sure um vanderpool what they he delayed his start again he was supposed to start this weekend right yeah he moved his start back to uh dendemond 
I think he heard you were coming, wanted to take a week and yeah. wait a little bit. Yeah, was, yeah, right. That was the intel I got on it. Oh, I know they said oh. something about a knee injury, but that's that's he was he was worried about Curtis White. Yeah, yonga, 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 yonga. <laughs> All right, man. Well, it's late there. Uh, yeah. I think that we covered a lot. So um, let's do this again in about a week, huh? We'll do this. Hey, we missed our uh, our one-year anniversary, Tony. We did. Oh, I can't man. believe you forgot our anniversary. I how, sent you flowers. How could you do this to me? I sent you flowers. You didn't get them? Yeah, they're still in customs. They're being held <laughs> up. I'm going to get them in three weeks. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it, it, there's a lot of exciting stuff going on here. And, uh, oh, we didn't talk about the the new lifetime grand prix oh yeah 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 that's, so uh, that, that's a big you mentioned deal. this You're, briefly i think in the last pod but yep well it's I, I mentioned in the last podcast that i had applied uh to be a part of the lifetime grand prix um it, it was pretty exciting for i think a lot of a lot of north american athletes who uh if there's uncertainty about your spring and summer schedules or it it was this high level of racing it was strung together there was a storyline of a series um, it was, uh, or it is pretty exclusive. Uh, they had announced that only 20, 20 men, 20 women were going to be a part of it. Uh, the roster was released and I did not, uh, I was not accepted to be a part of the series. So it's, you know, it, it is what it is. And I think with not being accepted, that provides, uh, opportunities in and of itself. So, um, congratulations to, to everyone who's accepted to that. I do know uh, of several cyclocrossers who did apply uh, and weren't a part of it. I know uh, really the only cyclocrosser I believe was Lance Haydet. Um, so it's it, it's going to be a pretty stacked field. Yeah, I'll be curious to see. I don't know a lot about it, um, but I'll be curious to see sort of how that evolves and hopefully they build something interesting. Um, I don't know what the criteria was. I know that's been some part of the conversation and I know there's been some, some critiques about, you know, making it exclusive and gravel that's not supposed to be, but I can also see, see what, you know, the purpose here too, if they're trying to develop storylines and they're trying to put prize money and they're trying to make something professional, it's not the same thing as, as the amateur racing and they're separating that out. And in some ways, I think that's wise. I think we often have too much connections between the amateurs and the pro racing that hurts the pro level. So, um, Maybe they'll do something special and they'll be able to accept more people or provide more opportunities for more people down the road. So, yeah, I would love to see that. But, um, I mean, yeah, yeah, to that point, you know, kind of making it a little bit more exclusive, uh, bit of a bummer, but I, I, I can understand if they want to kind of invest more in promoting a, a certain pool of athletes that they have. So mm -hmm. it raises their, their level, their profile. Uh, and hopefully it's ultimately what everyone wants is the sport to continue to grow and progress and attract as many people as possible. So if, if this is a positive step in that direction, then I'm for it. Yeah. Yeah. Good luck to him. Hopefully something really cool comes of it. We'll see how it goes. So. All right. Well, with that, we'll leave you to it. All right, man. See you on TV this weekend. Yeah. I'll be waving to you. I know. I don't know. Tell, tell Wild I'm just I kidding. I, I, that, that's not, I, that's going to be probably the last thing I'm thinking about. My, I'm going to be <laughs> breathing out of my eyeballs and just, I mean, it, I, I'm excited to be back, but it's, it's always during this period, during the curse period, everyone's at every race and they're at a hundred percent. So that was, you know, through November, um, a big part of me staying home and training through the month is yes, I wanted to prepare for Pan Ams and nationals, but also for my European campaign. Um, you know, making sure that I was coming in with the depth and the preparation that I needed to sustain that effort all the way through the world championships and compete at a high level. So I'm excited to, to see how this turns out and excited for these opportunities. All right. All right. We're out. We're out with that. Tony, take care. I'll see you from the TV this weekend. And, uh, Everyone, thank you very much for listening. And, uh, you know, I hope you're able to follow along the races. Uh, before we sign off, I want to give everyone a quick reminder. If you haven't done so yet, please like, share, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. It helps us grow the show, get the word out, hopefully get as many people involved in the sport as we can. That's ultimately the goal here. So that's all I have for this week. Take care, stay healthy, keep riding. We'll talk to you all soon.